Welcome everybody to the afternoon session. Our, uh, our first speaker is Professor Mariam Fazel from uh, UW. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, good afternoon. So I'll be talking about uh, designing smoothing for online optimization, for improved competitive ratio in online optimization. And first of all, I have to mention this is joint work with uh, my former student, Reza Eghwali, who's here. And he's now a postdoc or a fellow in this program at Simons Institute. So definitely, if you have, asked, uh, if you have questions about this work, go to Reza. He knows a lot better than I do. Um, and the topic of this talk is a little bit perhaps different from some of the other talks in this workshop. Um, and you will see the approach is a little bit different, but hopefully there will be a lot of connections that will arise. And if you spot some new connections, do let us know. OK. So we're going to look at a problem that comes up in a very general setting of online resource allocation. So I'll first write down the problem, parse it, and then we'll give a lot of different examples of in, uh, in what cases would such an optimization problem come up. So first, forget about the word online. Let's consider this offline optimization problem. I want to maximize a function of summation of coefficients times my variables, so linear mapping of these variables xt, subject to constraints on these decision variables xt. So optimization variables are these xt's. Each of them are n-dimensional. The time horizon, or the number of these variables, is m. And ft's are convex sets. We assume, for now at least, uh, there may be extensions possible, but we assume psi is a concave function. This function here is concave. And uh, in effect here, this is a very compact form uh, for this function to capture two things, revenue and budget. And later, when we look at examples, we separate the role of those two subparts of this function. Um, but it's something we want to maximize. So you can think of it as it's a revenue plus negative of violation of budget, something like that. Uh, now, there is a cone involved in the setting up this problem. So k is a proper convex cone. And the role of the cone is that these xt's actually belong to a cone. And these at's are such that they are cone preserving in the sense that the output, ATXT, also belongs to the cone. And uh, basically, the role of the cone here is that it gives us an ordering on these ATXTs, and we will find that useful. And the typical cones are going to be the RN plus cone, the positive orthant, that just orders vectors entry-wise, or the positive semi-definite cone that gives you matrix ordering. So we want to actually keep it general, because we will use both of those cones in, in different settings. So, so far, this is an offline optimization problem. If I actually have all the problem data, the psi and the a's and the f's, I can just solve it. It's a convex optimization problem. What happens if you have constraints that actually connect together, link together x uh, that is implicit, in fact, in the psi. Psi is actually connecting all your xt's. So that's why the budget can be, actually, some examples will come up. But yeah, good question. So what's the online setting? We are interested to solve this problem in the online setting. Online setting means that um, we are given, before the algorithm starts, or before everything starts, we are given the psi. So algorithm uh, that wants to solve this problem in online fashion knows psi, but it does not know at or ft until time t. So at time t, there is these new inputs come to the algorithm. And in this talk, we want to look at an adversarial sequence of uh, incoming ATFTs, but there are different models for that. Here, adversarial. Um, then the algorithm wants to assign a new variable xt. And once it's assigned xt, this xt does not change for the remaining time. So you see at and ft, you decide on xt and keep it fixed. By the way, this form can be simplified a little bit by pushing the ATs inside FTs, but that makes things even more compact and connection to application a little more murky. So we'll keep it like this. OK, so that's offline. This is the online problem. And our goal will be to talk about algorithms that are online that whose uh, value of objective that they achieve divided by the value of the offline problem um, is good. So that's called competitive ratio. Okay. So what's an example? Perhaps the big example that made this class of problems famous is this problem called the AdWords problem. Comes up in online advertising. So for example, if you're Google, who's running a search engine, and you have a bunch of advertisers who have given you their limited budgets, and they have asked you to show their ads uh, in response to a query into coming to the search engine. 
Uh, then when a query comes in, you have to decide which ad to show. And suppose, for example, query one comes in. Uh, then three of the advertisers, for example, bid on that query and say that they want their ad shown and they will pay this much for it. Um, the search engine has to decide. Suppose it's an integer case in which it has to pick one of them. So then it will, let's say, match this one. And so see what's happening relative to the general problem that we had before. In this problem, those AT matrices are simply diagonal. Diagonal entries are the values of the uh, bids that each uh, advertiser makes on this query. So in this case, there are only three non-zeros in that diagonal matrix. And xt is just a 0, 1 vector that shows this assignment in this example. Then the next one comes in. And again, three advertisers bid on it. The search engine, based on its own online algorithm, will pick one, and so on. And this <laughs> keeps going. And at the end, you want to judge how well this algorithm did. Suppose four queries came in, then everything ended. So what's the optimization problem for this example? So here, the psi will be some function that looks like this. In the simplest case, it's linear and then flat. So it's a piecewise linear function. Uh, this is the rev revenue of the search engine from the ith advertiser uh, as a function of how much it allocated or how many times it showed it, the ad of that uh, uh, advertiser uh, times the bid of the advertiser. So, so its summation uh, is a function of this u where u is this. Uh, for the ith advertiser, this is over time how much you got from that advertiser. And the search engine wants to maximize the total revenue, so sum over all advertisers of those psi i's. And the constraint here is that the xi's have to be non-negative, and they have to sum up to 1. And uh, this would be called fractional assignment. If you wanted integer, you can ask for integer. But in this talk, we are not going to ask for integer. It's fractional. OK, so that's the problem. So we want to maximize function of this shape subject to the ft will be given by this guy. And ATs are given by the bids, and the psi is this shape. Okay? So a bit more general example is an online linear program, uh, technically online packing linear program, which is of this form. So this is our usual linear program. Um, here, it's a, we write it as a summation of inner product of vectors. And this one also as a summation of matrices times vectors that, uh, that's not equal to some fixed budget B. Uh, and again, some individual xt constraints. Um, packing problem actually enforces that these coefficients are all non-negative, and these are also non-negative. Um, we can express this problem in the same canonical form by writing the objective overall like this. Basically, we didn't allow for this budget in our constraint before. So how do we handle it? We bring it up here with an indicator function as a penalty. So the overall objective is summation of the rewards. Uh, minus indicator function of how much the budget is violated. And this is the function that's 0 when it's not violated, and infinity goes to infinity when it's violated. So at least with this uh, nasty function indicator, we can write this as a case of the previous form. And well, applications of this, it's really all over the place. It actually uh, comes up a lot in online algorithms in the CS theory, but also has a history in the OR literature in inventory problems and revenue management, revenue maximization. And so one recent paper on the topic that actually also refers a lot to the previous literature is by uh, Agar Wal Wang and Ye, Yin Yu Ye's group. And, uh, and also, this is a, a, these are some papers that cover uh, this uh, from the CS literature, but there is a lot more. So there's literature that is inside these papers. Um, also to point out, AdWords is a special case of, of an online linear program. Um, to make the online linear program a little more concrete, uh, this is the example that motivates the OR literature. So you have, a, you, you have an inventory with a fixed number of items in it. So the vector B here gives you uh, the number of items. That is a fixed budget. And these are each uh, five items that you have. And uh, at time one, um, a demand vector is presented to the algorithm. Let's say demand vector is this B1 that says a uh, customer wants a bundle of these two items, and it will pay this much for it. So this is the vector that comes in. And the coefficient of it, which in this case is a scalar, so this corresponds to online LP where n is 1, so xt's are scalars. Um, the coefficient needs to be picked by the algorithm, some number between 0 and 1. So whether to fill the order or partially fill that order. And uh, the next time, 
another uh, demand comes in with another uh, bid that is offered. And again, the inventory owner has to decide. So this is, uh, this is the uh, general setting of the algorithm. And the problem is that, so if you don't know the future, of course, you may run out of budget too early. And then some very good offer comes, and you no longer have that item in your inventory. So um, yeah, that's another example. Um, another example, so so far these examples, you can uh, always think of them as vectors in the non-negative orthant. And the ordering was just a non-negative ordering. Um, but here's an example where we need to think of matrices and matrix ordering. So here, this is from online the optimal experiment design. So optimal experiment design is a big topic in statistics, which is about choosing a set of experiments such that uh, when you solve a least squares problem with those uh, set of experiments, which is kind of uh, vectors chosen for linear measurements, then the total covariance of the estimator is small in some sense. One of those senses is the volume of the error covariance, which is captured by log of the depth of a matrix. And uh, in this case, we are looking at the online version of this problem. So you want to basically minimize estimation error after m time steps, subject to the xt's, again, bounded by some fixed budget and some num being between 0 and 1. So uh, has everybody seen online uh, or experiment design in general? Experiment design problem in statistics, yeah. OK, no. so you're familiar to the offline, no? no. OK, so if you haven't, very briefly, very briefly, so <laughs> this is not the focus of the talk, so I won't. But very briefly, basically, you, there is a fixed vector that is unknown. And then there are these measurement vectors, ATs. And you take the inner product. When you run an experiment, it means you take the inner product plus some noise. The noise is often assumed to be zero mean Gaussian. This is the measurement vector. After you accumulate some a number of measurement vectors, you stack them together, solve a least squares problem. The error of that least squares estimate is uh, its covariance is the inverse of this matrix. And the more you add experiments, so the, the more ATs that you pick, you add rank one matrices here, you make the matrix such that its inverse becoming smaller. So, now, how do you measure this log that is one measure? It's volume of the error, but you have other measures like random max of this uh, covariance matrix and things like that. Um, so this is very, I mean, there's a lot of literature on the offline setting, but uh, not really much on the online. So we're interested in the online setting. Um, so, so online setting means these ATs are presented one by one, and then you will decide how much of your budget to allocate to each one. And uh, in the end, you want to perform well. So here, the key is that the cone to be considered is the positive semi-definite cone, because these guys, this matrix that you're building and these elements that you're picking and adding are all matrices. And they're all positive <coughs> semi-definite matrices. So they're ordered with respect to the PSD cone. And that ordering, again, will be helpful for algorithms to work. Excuse me. What is the XT? Uh, That's uh, some decision variable. For example, what proportion of your total budget do you allocate to that uh, experiment? Could be its cost, money, or it could be if it was zero one, it would be pick, not pick. So why does it feature in the error covariance matrix? Yes, it is here. So the covariance matrix is initial uncertainty plus summation of AT, AT transpose XT. So this scalar XT, if it's zero, it's you have not picked that particular AT. And if it is one, you have picked it. So you're allowing the, um, to do half an experiment? Here, yes. That's a fraction. Well, what does that mean? You'll be half well, it could be cost. <laughs> <laughs> no, it could actually be, be cost. Like you actually pay half of what they say it costs. And maybe they get, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, there could be scenarios where this is a continuous variable. I mean, actually, in reality, in experiment design, if it's a very, very large scale problem, you really round, you take this variable to be a percentage of experiments of a certain kind that you're running. Mm. Uh, but it really depends on application. In some application, you really need it to be integer. So um, later, one can v visit this integer versions as well, but that's an extra complication. So for now, we keep the variables continuous. Any other questions? So yes. The ordering that you're talking about, I didn't uh, quite catch. So if you go back to the simpler problem, like the adverbs. Mm -hmm. uh, so two ordering? vectors are ordered with respect to the non-negative orthant means that every uh, el element in the vector is bigger than the every element. It's like element-wise order. And in the matrix case, it's uh, with respect to the positive semi-definite cone. Um, so one matrix dominates the other if the eigenvalues. Uh, I mean, yeah. So. Um, 
We are not yet using it, but we are pointing out which cone would be relevant for which problem. Okay. okay. Um, Question. Your algorithm already knows the cone product. The cone, yes. Yeah, the psi function and the cone are known. The a's and f's are not known. Yeah. OK, so here we are going to talk about um, online primal dual approaches. So kind of an optimization person's view of uh, these algorithms. Uh, basically, this is kind of a, intended to be a quick high level view of a set of existing algorithms in the literature put together in a broad way. Uh, hopefully, it gives you some idea. But for specific algorithms, you have to look at specific problems. Uh, then we will talk about the competitive ratio, at least the bound on competitive ratio that can be achieved by these two classes of algorithms. Uh, that competitive ratio, we can bound it nicely if we make an assumption that is uh, a type of a diminishing returns assumption. We'll see that later. And once we have that bound on competitive ratio, here's the main uh, goal of this talk. We want to design uh, the problem, or in a way, design the algorithm to perform best, to optimize the competitive ratio. And we can do it by designing a smooth version of that original psi function. So the main part of the talk will come when we talk about that, how to do that, and we show we can do it by convex optimization. So the first part is going to be a high level view of the algorithms. Again, these are hopefully familiar algorithms to you, but presented from probably uh, maybe not the way you usually see them, but uh, let's see. Okay. So the original optimization problem was maximize psi of summation of ATXT subject to XT and FT. Hmm? And it's dual. So first thing to do is write down the dual problem. Here's the dual. The dual is minimize over dual variable Y summation of support functions of AT transpose Ys minus the conjugate of the psi function. So let's remind ourselves, what is the conjugate? Conjugate fun function of a concave function is the smallest value of the line minus the value of the function. That's the definition of conjugate. It's just that it's inf because it's a concave conjugate. Um, usually, we are used to convex, and that one, that's a soup. Um, support for, uh -huh. So this uh, psi uh, sigma sub t function is the support function of the set ft, which is nothing but this. Maximize uh, inner product of x with, AT with whatever value you're evaluating at over the set. So maximize linear function over your set. And that's called the support function. And this is the picture that depicts the conjugate. Well, we all know it. So OK, so that's the dual. Next thing to write is the optimality condition for this optimization problem. Uh, here are the optimality conditions arranged in a way that you see the optimal primal variable, optimal dual variable. Um, note that optimality condition is for a set of x's, right? All of them are optimal here. And one single dual variable y, x1 through xm primal and one dual variable y. So the x's have to satisfy, they have to maximize uh, these support functions but with the optimal y plugged in. And the optimal y is the gradient of the psi at all the optimal x's. So that's the optimality condition. Um, and the reason we wrote it is that just looking at this gives an idea of a very simple algorithm to try to uh, solve these in an online fashion. And here's a very simple algorithm. In the online setting, when at time t I get a t and f t, I can try to pick the xt. <coughs> algorithm can try to pick xt. So hat means what our algorithm picks, the sequential approach. Um, pick x that maximizes inner product with the best estimate of the dual variable. So plug in the best estimate of the dual variable you have so far, instead of the true y star, which we don't know. And update the y by plugging in all the x's that your algorithm has decided so far, and then looking at the gradient at that point. Uh, by the way, if the function is not differentiable, everything goes through with sub-differentials. But for simplicity, we assume it's differentiable. <coughs> so this type of algorithm might remind you, for example, of Frank Wolf type algorithms. Uh, or there are many other algorithms of, of this kind. And uh, this is just a small side remark that Oftentimes, if this set, for example, is a polytope, you actually get an integer assignment out of this. But we are not going into that. Uh, we don't care at the moment. We, it can be a continuous set. It can be a continuous x. Okay, so this is one type of algorithm. 
uh, but it's not the only way to approach the problem. Actually, let's re rewrite that algorithm or that broad algorithm in a slightly differently. By rewriting it, we'll see some nice connections to other, other fields. Um, so here's the algorithm again. That was the first step, assign the x. When we said we update the y, we evaluate the gradient at all the summation of a, s, excesses up to time t. So what does this mean? We can rewrite this thing equivalently using the definition of conjugate as this. So it says that this is, let's say, equal. Gradient is unique. Um, so y, y hat t plus 1 equals the minimizer of this problem. And if you look at carefully at this, this looks like a problem that at least people in uh, machine learning have seen a lot, online learning problem. Uh, these are the usual what people call LTs, the linear costs that are coming in one by one. This is like their classifier vector that they keep updating. And this is a regularizer. So we can view the dual update here as doing uh, what they would call uh, a FTRL algorithm, follow the regularized leader, with this particular regularization, that is the conjugate of psi. Uh, also, others would call it dual averaging algorithm because this, this is... Uh, the averaging of the previous values. So this step of the algorithm is very reminiscent of uh, those online learning approaches, which kind of also hints that this uh, particular online resource allocation problem, its dual is very related to online learning problems in which people study regret. So if you were wondering, is regret going to come up in this talk, it's actually coming in the dual, not on the primal. It doesn't make sense for the primal, but for, for the dual. Uh -huh. Now, so this was all about this algorithm that decided to do, the, do things sequentially. Can we do anything else? So actually, if we revisit the optimality conditions again, ideally our goal is to solve for x star and y star together, not update them one by one. Can we do that? So up until time t, with whatever information we have, yeah, we can also solve a saddle point problem up until time t. And that means minimize over y, maximize over x, this thing. And uh, if we do that, this is actually overall a convex, convex, in x, uh, uh, convex in y and concave in x problem, so one can solve it. If you solve it, then this gives you another way of uh, updating x and y. So this will give you a better update, we will see, in terms of competitive ratio. But of course, it's a lot more computation. This one was less computation. And this is a very high level r way of writing it. You have to actually pick a particular way of solving this subproblem. Uh, in order to talk about amount of computation. But, for example, some known algorithms can be viewed as instances of this. For example, continuous update algorithm that, uh, for instance, has been used for online linear programming uh, and online concave uh, or online uh, covering problem in uh, Bookbinder and others is actually uh, can be viewed as a case of this. So this continuous varying uh, variation of the x and the y together, it's uh, trying to basically solve this saddle point. OK, any questions on the very high level view of algorithms? Yes. Wait, so both of these algorithms should be easy to state without actually referring to the dual variables, right? The first one is just saying something mm -hmm. like, pick whatever choice minimizes the local linear approximation from the mm -hmm. gradient. And the second one is just saying, Pick which everything minimizes the function so far. Is that right? Yes. Okay. That's Great. exactly true. So they're yeah. both super reasonable strategies. Uh, yeah, exactly. They're both very reasonable strategies. It's actually helpful to think in terms of dual, but you don't have to. Yeah. <coughs> okay. So competitive ratio. In order to get a, a bound on the competitive ratio, we need an assumption. So we're going to first make this assumption on our psi function. Um, we say that psi satisfies diminishing returns. So this is actually what we call diminishing return. Uh, it's consistent with other definitions of diminishing return, but uh, uh, it hasn't been exactly written this way. OK, so if a vector u is bigger than vector v with respect to cone k, so this was, here's where the ordering comes in. If this vector is bigger than this one with respect to k, then the gradient of psi at u is less than gradient of psi at v with respect to the dual cone. So if k is rn plus, this just says if the vector is entry-wise increasing, the value of the gradient entry-wise decreases. It goes opposite to the vector, or it has a, it's anti-tone. Um, so or, or the, so the, more, the more your value increases, the lower your slope. That's why it's like diminishing return. So um, what's the result then? Under this assumption, um, the simplest form of the result 
uh, is for the monotone psi function. And actually, as we saw in the morning in uh, Neep's talk, it's also monotone, non-monotone, even in uh, the submodular optimization context are very different from each other. Uh, monotone is easier. We state this first for monotone, but one can also do things for non-monotone functions. So for a monotone concave psi, that also satisfies diminishing return assumption. Um, simultaneous update approach um, achieves the following competitive ratio. The value of the algorithm divided by the optimal uh, objective value is bigger than this thing, 1 over uh, 1 minus alpha of psi. This alpha of psi is a quantity related to the function psi, which is defined like this. It's the smallest value of the ratio of the conjugate of psi evaluated at the gradient of psi divided by the function value. So conjugate evaluated at gradient divided by function value. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll actually in, try to interpret what this is, but before let me say that for the sequential update algorithm, it's such a, a similar bound as possible, but you will have another additive term. It's a little more complicated. Uh, but let's see, let's see what this one means. Uh, so this quantity alpha is, in a way, for those uh, familiar with submodularities, to us it's a little bit related to curvature of submodular functions, a little bit, in the sense that it's measuring deviation from linearity. Uh, so here, here it is in a one-dimensional case. If psi is one-dimensional, at point u0, I uh, draw the tangent. I look at the offset. That gives me this value. It's the negative of the conjugate at the, at the derivative, this value. Then divided by the function value, which is this length. So basically, we are looking at the ratio of this length over this length, over all the u's. Take the most negative one, and that's the alpha. Uh, so for example, alpha psi is going to be 0 if I have a line going through 0. For a perfectly linear function, it's 0. And uh, another extreme is for the AdWords function, which was line and then completely flat. For that, it's minus 1. So these are the extremes of alpha. So you can see it's sort of trying to measure curvature or deviation from linear. So um, the only quantity of the psi function that mattered in the competitive ratio was this thing, uh, this alpha. So the proof, I won't go through it. It's actually simple and fairly standard. You basically keep track of uh, the primal value that the algorithm is achieving, and also define some dual related quantity, which is this guy, and uh, bound the gap between the two, and show that the gap between these two, sort of a primal sequence, dual sequence, is uh, bounded by the conjugate of psi evaluated at the last estimate of the dual. And uh, then, so we have a bound on this gap. Uh, then this does not give us yet a competitive ratio, but bringing in the uh, diminishing return assumption, we can show that this dual-like value is bigger than the true d star. So this second part uses diminishing return. And putting them together, we get that the competitive ratio is bigger than 1 over 1 minus alpha. And uh, we know for monotone functions, alpha is uh, bigger than minus 1. So this automatically means competitive ratio is bigger than a half. That's always true. Uh, which is good. Uh, but of course, if you have specific psi function, uh, you can measure its alpha and get a better competitive ratio. Uh, and more importantly for us was that we want to actually design that alpha. We want to modify the psi such that it alpha becomes better, so we get a better competitive ratio. Uh, what happens for non-monotone functions is actually much more complicated. Um, this bound still holds. Uh, however, to actually bound it and get something non-trivial, not get zero, um, you need to actually make more assumptions on the problem data. You have to kind of restrict your adversary a little bit. Or you, um, how, how much effort the adversary is putting in shows up in your bound. Uh, this is analogous to the role of bit to budget ratio, for example, in uh, bounding competitive ratio of online linear packing problem. OK, so this brings us to the part that we want to focus on, which is to design. So, what is bad about, uh, so uh, how can we improve this alpha, basically, for a given psi? So when the algorithm starts, algorithm knows the psi function. It does not know the a's and the f's, but it knows the psi. Can it do anything to improve the situation? So the problem with, for example, this is the psi of the AdWords problem. The problem with this one is it is very discontinuous, so, um, or it's very non-differentiable. It has this sharp corner. 
And the problem is, if one applied a greedy type algorithm, or you applied the first sequential algorithm to this function, it, the algorithm does something really bad and stupid, in the sense that it just takes everything that comes in until it runs out of budget. Uh, the reason is, it takes this first value that came in, looks at the slope at that point, slope is 1. So it's encouraged to take the next one. It's taking the next one, slope is 1. And then later, when it uh, tries to take the third one, it's out of budget already. So the algorithm was, in a way, intuitively too aggressive. Whereas if the function looked like this, things would have been better. Because uh, here, it's as if the algorithm is backing off as it's getting closer and closer to running out of budget. It's becoming more and more conservative. So this curvature is, plays a big role. Uh, but what curvature is good for each problem is, uh, is not uh, obvious. Actually, for AdWords, for this problem, it can be worked out. But in general, how does one uh, smooth the function side? Uh, and what happens if I smooth psi? Well, I can take my original problem that was given to me with a psi in it. I come up with another function, psi s. I plug in the psi s into my algorithm. So I uh, assume that I'm optimizing with psi s. That means the, the two sets of algorithms change like this. In the sequential algorithm, the only change is your regularizer in the, in the dual update changes to something else. Instead of conjugate of psi, it's conjugate of some smooth function. In the simultaneous approach, it also shows up here, again, as some sort of regularizer. But then the problem is I'm changing the problem to something else. I solved the something else. But I still want to judge the algorithm with respect to the original problem. That's what competitive ratio does. So to do that, we have to, again, take the ratio of what's achieved by the algorithm over the initial problem. And uh, we do that. We can show competitive ratio is bounded by, again, 1 over 1 minus a new alpha, which now actually is combining both psi and psi s. So you can maybe think of it as a curvature of psi s with respect to psi, uh, which is now defined like this. So it's, again, conjugate at the gradient. But at the gradient of the new guy minus the value of the new guy divided by the value of the function. And if psi s equals psi, this is just exactly what we had before. Uh, so that's good. We have this freedom of modifying the function and seeing if things can get better. Um, this brings up an, a related idea in, in optimization, uh, which is called smoothing via conjugate functions. And this is actually used in uh, convex optimization, for example, for non-smooth optimization problems. You take a non-smooth problem, you come up with a way of smoothing it and solve the smooth problem, for example, using gradient descent, and then say, what's the complexity? What you know, trade off how much you smooth with the benefit in complexity? Um, so that idea is actually old. It goes back to Berserkos, Polyak, maybe even older to uh, Moreau and so on. So it's an old idea. Uh, the way to smooth it is, uh, in all these papers, is adding a strongly concave function to the conjugate of the original function. So it's as if you construct the psi s by, add, by figuring out a good phi, taking its conjugate, putting it here, conjugate again, get a psi s. So people in, in continuous optimization are probably used to this. Maybe others aren't, but it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, it is a way of coming up with a smooth function. So we can think of, can this approach work for these problems we just talked about? Um, for AdWords problem, in fact, yes. One can um, it, it basically redo existing literature in a way that it's as if they picked a phi and plugged in. And that phi, if you do that, that phi will be actually a shifted and scaled entropy function. And uh, when you plug it in the algorithm, it gives you the familiar multiplicative update algorithm with a very careful uh, chosen a set of parameters. And uh, that leads to the 1 over 1 minus 1 over e optimal uh, competitive ratio uh, for the AdWords problem. And this is done, I, I think, in several places, but one that analyzes it nicely and also gives the, uh, shows that this is, I think this was shown to be optimal in Meta, but also in Devon or Anjain in 2012. It's done in a careful way and it's optimized as well. Um, so that's for just for AdWords. Uh, for online LP, packing and covering, uh, packing was the one we discussed. Covering is kind of its dual. Uh, similar approaches and very nice algorithms uh, are known uh, due to Bookbinder now and authors and other co-authors uh, that give the best known competitive ratio. Um, 
there is a slide in the end where I kind of list the known uh, instances of, of results in the literature. Um, but for us, the problem is we don't know how to pick this best phi. Basically, you need a lot of clever ideas to handcraft it for each problem. But if I have a general problem, is there a way to figure out? And also, maybe I don't want to plug in a strong deconcave phi. Maybe this phi better not even be uh, concave. So in general, how do I pick this smooth thing? If it's not concave, can you go through the analysis or the algorithm you want? Uh, actually, yeah, because I mean the the psi s needs to be concave, but you can. Oh, okay. So you still want psi s to be concave. Uh, the psi s we want to be concave, so we want to actually the optimization problem uh, to work. But but the, um, uh, but the thing that you added and then to conjugate is not. So I mean, for example, in Nessar of this would be L two norm squared, very simple things, or a one or something like that. But uh, usually L two norm or weighted L two norm. Uh, but we don't want that, maybe. We want something more complicated, let's say. And actually, it doesn't need to be concave. There will be an example coming up. OK, so how do we design optimal? So let's just actually write down the optimization problem of find me the best size s for this purpose. Uh, so uh, for the simple case, we can write down the optimization problem, and, and it's quite tractable. Simplest case is this. When the psi is separable, so it's a summation of psi i of ui, which is the case, for example, in AdWords. This, these I uh, indicated the different advertisers. Um, and we want to design the smoothed psi s to optimize the competitive ratio bound. So it's essentially, we want to optimize the alpha as a function of choices of psi s. However, the constraint that psi s needs to satisfy for our bounds to be valid is that it has to satisfy that diminishing return. So also impose diminishing return on your psi. And uh, we can do this offline because we only need to know psi. Uh, so if this design problem is actually not very efficient or fast, doesn't matter. It's an offline problem. Well, once we solve it, then we run the algorithm online with the psi s plugged in as the data comes. So the optimization problem would look like this. Um, we need to maximize the alpha. That's exactly the alpha in the competitive ratio uh, over the variables alpha and the function y. So this is now a continuous infinite dimensional optimization, as it's written. Y is a continuous function on, with domain 0 to infinity. And uh, this Y actually is the derivative of psi. It was easier, and we'll see later that this is more uh, convenient, to parameterize in terms of derivative of psi. So our, we changed variables to Y. So this is basically psi s minus psi conjugate of psi prime. Uh, over psi less than or equal to 1 minus alpha, right? It's ex exactly that same equation we had before. Uh, now we need to optimize overall y's and alphas. Uh, this condition guarantees that the psi s that comes out satisfies uh, diminishing return. Also, in this one dimensional case, it guarantees that the psi s that comes out is concave. So uh, it's infinite dimensional problem, so technically it's hard to solve, but uh, for this one-dimensional problem, we can easily discretize it, simply take discretize the function y. Um, and also, the, its interval is infinite, so truncate this interval. Uh, for specific uh, application problems, there's very reasonable ways of truncating. So for example, in AdWords, the function flattens in the end. So you can always truncate it without losing anything. In other cases, you may lose something, but numerically, it's not bad. So subject to that, those numerical issues, we can solve the problem. So here's one example where we did this. Um, AdWords problem was linear and then completely flat. We just took that and modified it to an objective function that has two breakpoints. So AdWords with two breakpoints. Uh, it's basically this piecewise linear function. And uh, we ran the algorithm, the design algorithm that we had on it. Uh, and we got this thing. This is the smooth side that we got, the, the blue curve. Then we wanted to see if this corresponds to some phi if we had used this Nestor of style approach. So we took the conjugate of this blue guy and subtracted it from conjugate of the original function to see what's the conjugate of the function that was added. And it turns out that what was added was not a concave function. So in this example, it does not correspond to finding a single phi uh, in, in the model of uh, basically the Nestor of idea. Um, then we thought of something else, because there was very clever ways of solving AdWords with a single breakpoint. Can one take that clever idea and do it for two breakpoints? 
If you want to do that, you can think of the following. OK, so this function is a summation of this single breakpoint function and this single breakpoint function. Um, I can smooth these individually without the numerical thing, just by using the trick in, like, let's say, the Von and Jane paper. And uh, you come up with two smooth functions, then add those. How well would this do? So this actually does fine, but uh, not the best. So this is a comparison of the what function was added if you do the computational approach or if you do this handcrafted approach. And the handcrafted approach suffers in the competitive ratio a little bit. So one gains something by doing the design, by solving the optimization problem. Mm. And let's see. OK, I, I have enough time. Any questions so far? Um, I was also going to point out there's um, the only place I have seen at least in the CS literature where something like this was done was um, was actually in, in the Devon and Jane 2012 on, uh, on AdWords with concave return. And what they do is that in, in order to tune their algorithm, they actually say they need to solve a differential equation. In fact, the differential equation they solve is this constraint satisfied with equality. So whenever this is satisfied with equality, this is equivalent to a differential equation because we wrote it as an integral, but you can also, there was a, a prime here, the derivative. And in the AdWords case and, and problems of, of that form, it's in the AdWords itself, it's simple enough to solve it analytically. Uh, it's a linear uh, ordinary differential equation. You can solve it, you get exponential as a solution. In the AdWords with concave return is not analytical, but uh, the one who and Jane suggested you can numerically solve it and find the right constant and plug it, in, plug it in the algorithm. So we can think of this optimization problem as generalizing that, that view, that philosophy that you want to um, optimize and find what's the best uh, algorithm for this specific psi. Okay, so then I wanted to also show, uh, in more recent work we decided to look at that, going back to that uh, optimal experiment design problem, where the variable was a matrix. Uh, we wanted to see if we can do this design thing there. And it's actually uh, trickier, but also very interesting, uh, because there you're solving the problem over matrices, so the problem there can be written as this. You want to maximize some function of, um, uh, in experiment design, these uh, BTs are rank one matrices, AT, AT transpose. So AT, AT transpose times XT. So that was the, for example, covariance of the error after running M experiments uh, or after running whatever set of experiments. Uh, plus, this thing can be penalizing your budget function. So I removed the summation of XT minus B less than zero from constraint, put it here with some penalty. Uh, so if this penalty is the indicator function, like that, this is exactly equivalent to the experiment design problem. Now for a certain class of functions H, we can uh, write down the same uh, design problem. This class of functions are called trace functions. So they're spectral functions, functions of eigenvalues of the underlying matrix. But all the eigenvalues go through the same scalar function, little h. So for example, log of determinant, that's one case. So the function would then be uh, log, so log det of identity plus, or epsilon identity plus u. The little h corresponding to it is the log of one plus u. Or another, um, and, and this, as we saw, comes up in the optimal experiment design. Another example is trace of epsilon times identity plus u inverse. And this comes up in a optimal experiment design. It's another criterion uh, in experimental design. And in here, it will be the corresponding little h is 1 over 1, 1 minus 1 over 1 plus u, something like that. OK, so. So the idea, uh, question? Sorry. Yes. Uh, it, it, so when you, when an indicator of a set is part of your objective and you smoothen, do you lose something in terms of visibility? Um, because you, you're smoothing an indicator and yes. it may happen that you actually violate some of the constraints by a small amount. Yeah, you might. So uh, the certain type of results can be, um, can be expressed as here's the ratio of the objectives that you get if you allow this much violation of constraint. So maximum value of any of the constraints being violated is blocked, for example. Or you can enforce feasibility of the constraint, but then lose in the ratio that you get. 
So if you really want to strictly satisfy it, you get worse results. If you allow some violation, you get better results. And actually, I will write down the result for this that allows for violation and trades off the two things. So yeah, it's a very good question. Yes? Your second thing for the A <coughs> that one actually doesn't satisfy diminishing returns in general, right? Um, yes, it does not. You're right. So that's not a problem? Yeah. Ah. If our psi s satisfies diminishing return, we're OK. So basically, we can replace it by an approximation of it that satisfies. Yeah, that's a very good question. Because um, uh, yeah, if you look at, it, if you look at uh, discrete experimental design, then if you ask the question, is this submodular in the subset selected? The answer is this one is not submodular, while this one is submodular. And in our language, yeah, this one does satisfy the machine, then this one does not. But for us, as long as we can find a good approximation in, in some sense, the psi s, the smooth version that satisfies the diminishing return, we are good. OK, is it so, clear what that should be or not? What's that? Is it actually clear what such an approximation should be for this function? Or? No, not really. We, saw, we get some very weird things. Okay. Actually, we show some numerical examples later. So um, if, if there is an interpretation, if there is a way to give insight to it, that would be great, actually. But so far, uh, yeah, we don't know. So that's the matrix version of the problem. And uh, uh -huh. so now here, one can write the design optimization problem similar to what we had before. So let's try to do that. Uh, the only thing is I wrote this problem a little differently than the one that had a single psi. Now my psi has two pieces, H piece and G piece. And, but it's OK. So it means that I have to find the smooth version of this and a smooth version of this. So there are two things to solve over, HS and GS, smooth version of each of these. For the H part, we want to find a, a little HS such that it satisfies diminishing return. And for the G part, we want to find a, a concave smooth uh, G function. Um, our goal is to maximize the competitive ratio. Uh, we can also explicitly say and also minimize budget violation and trade these two things off. So the most general case would be to pick a trade-off parameter to capture the trade-off between the competitive ratio and the budget, and then let this gamma vary. And actually, that's uh, towards your question. You get a different trade-off between them. So again, we can change variables for the h part to its derivative, little y. And here's the optimization problem. Now, we wrote something strange looking here. Uh, but this is, this is really nice, because we needed to represent functions whose derivatives are monotone over, this, over the positive semi-definite cone, functions of matrices whose derivatives are mo monotone. And it's uh, very cumbersome. It's, you can, in this case, we cannot discretize uh, in a brute force manner that we did for the Rn plus case. right? Uh, so we need a good representation of functions that satisfy this monotonicity. And it turns out Lohner's theorem provides that. So all matrix monotone functions have a very nice representation in terms of this for integral form with respect to a measure. And so here, mu is a measure. Uh, lambda is this, the variable inside the integral. These are certain type of rational functions. And the, their uh, integral gives you, discovers the cl uh, class of all matrix monotone functions. So what I've done by writing this is that the derivative of our desired function is now enforced to be monotone, so it satisfies DR. So it's very nice that Lohner theorem actually allows us to represent uh, that set that we want to optimize over in a nice way. Because otherwise, if you don't have a good representation, this is it's not obvious how to do this at all. And then even, even if I write the optimization problem, it's useless. So it was good to have this. And this constraint is exactly the same as before. Uh, and this u max is where I truncated the u. I still need to do this truncation. And I may lose something there. But again, in practice, it's not bad. So could you remind me what the little u was? And what's sort of um, so this is just a variable here that this set of equa uh, inequalities have to be satisfied for all u. How does it uh, sort of fit into the bigger picture? So this is the univariate? Uh, uh, the matrix u. Actually, let me go back to the problem. Uh, we call this whole matrix u, the variable that appears inside and how does the cap Oh, capital U to the little u. So um, uh, capital U is a matrix. Uh, I, in H is a function of its, of its eigenvalues. So these would be little u's. The, yeah, little u's are the eigenvalues. Yeah. Sorry about the cumbersome notation. 
uh, but by this point, we now have, again, a continuous optimization problem. But again, infinite dimensional so we have, that we have to discretize. And a little bit worse, because in, it's a, there's an integral we also need to discretize as well. But as long as we discretize them finely, finely enough, uh, each is just a one-dimensional integral. So we have to minimize over beta and u and the measure mu, um, this beta subject to these constraints. The gamma was a fixed constant that we picked that is exactly the trade-off parameter between uh, competitive ratio and violation of budget. So we can fix gamma, plug, this, plug it in here, and solve. Uh, we, I didn't say what happens to the G. So this, this uh, optimization problem finds the HS, the smooth uh, H. Uh, now, what happens to the G part? The G part actually happens to have an easy solution. So you can write down the condition that, or inequality that G needs to satisfy, the GS, the smooth G. Uh, but that is actually equivalent to a very simple differential equation that can be solved in closed form, and this is its solution. It's, in fact, convolution of an exponential with H prime. This is the first order differential equation with h prime on the right hand side. So naturally, it gives this solution. And so this is nice. So the g part can be solved and plugged in, and you only have to computationally solve for h. In the end, what do we get? Um, we can express theorems of this kind. We can write it different ways. Uh, all of them are very messy, but here's one attempt to say what we get. So if the u max that you truncated after is picked large enough, and so from here we see it does not need to be too large. It just needs to be larger than the maximum eigenvalue of all the data that came in. If you kind of know like there is a big number that you know no matrix bigger than that is going to come, that's good enough for, this, uh, for truncation. OK, if the truncation is picked well, um, then with hs and gs, with gs of this form, whose derivative is this, and hs, that's the solution of the optimization problem on the previous slide, we can show the uh, objective divided by opt, so that this side would be competitive ratio, is 1 over gamma over e minus 1 plus beta. And beta is the solution of the optimization problem we got. So we get a constant uh, bound on the competitive ratio. Um, and uh -huh, here's the budget violation. With budget used is a messy number. <laughs> But it's actually related to the, it's the inverse mapping of the derivative of GS evaluated at a certain point. The initial slope of H times the largest trace of the incoming matrices. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so, so basically this gives you, um, we are trying to actually find a good interpretation and maybe reduce it to special cases. But so far, we haven't gotten. Oh, the gamma is in GS. Oh, gamma is in GS, but gamma was actually a fixed number that we pick to trade off, basically, budget violation and, uh, and competitive ratio. I'm asking because in shift, yeah, it's the B prime bound, there was no gamma explicitly, but sitting in GS. Yes, that's right. That's right. It's a little implicit and strange. Um, GS itself depends on gamma. Would it simplify if you put an impulse bound on B prime, like how much violation you allow, essentially? Uh, in other optimization problem or no, but you yeah, you still have these quantities even if you write it that yeah. way. Yeah, yeah, because this is exactly the budget violation. So if you say this is less than something, then that something will show up here. But um, so one can get a competitive ratio uh, that trades off with budget violation for this general class of problems, and once you design it, whatever comes out of your design gives you. Um, how to get that. So that beta that comes out of the optimization problem with the HS and GS give you this result. Uh, oh. oh, somehow these uh, figures aren't showing up very well. But here is an example of GS and smooth GS. So GS, one, one example would be the negative indicator function. A negative indicator, for example, at the budget goes to minus infinity. And after smoothing, it could be, for example, with different uh, gamma parameters, it's this or this. So if you're using the screen one, it's really allowing you to violate the budget. If you're using the red one, it's only a little bit. So there is that, that kind of trade-off. But they're all not satisfying the budget exactly, these two. So this is, for certain gamma, you get this GS in closed form. And then we solve the optimization problem. We get. Uh, 
uh, this blue H is from this original H. This original H itself was even smooth. This is the problem of uh, log u plus, uh, 1 plus u. Uh, so it's smooth already, but you can still do the design to get a better curvature. And one thing that is very strange is uh, this is the underlying measure mu of lambda that you get. Um, it can look very strange. We don't really have any insight. In some examples, this actually got us a, a nice atomic measure. But uh, in some examples, it does not. So we don't yet have a good insight about that. Uh, but basically, this is smoothing the problem of the optimal experiment design. And uh, we can also do it for the a-optimal experiment design. And uh, here you can see that, for example, if you also want to see how uh, budget violation ratio changes with respect to this trade-off parameter, you can see that it's, it's going down. And this is with the different values of uh, that B prime, bound on B prime. Um, and this is competitive ratio versus the gamma. Again, gamma is that trade-off parameter. So if you, your competitive ratio is uh, better if your gamma is smaller. And uh, again, you can trade off. But when competitive ratio is better, you're actually violating budget. So again, we can numerically solve for these. And uh, uh -huh, some related literature um, before I finish. I wanted to mention, again, so in, the, uh, in special cases, there's a lot of work done. Uh, online primal dual algorithms, in, there are in many, many papers. I did not do a good job at all of reviewing the literature, so sorry about that. Uh, but in particular, for example, uh, Sefi and Niv Bookbinder have shown uh, this for uh, online linear program. And uh, the one, the paper I did mention was matching with concave return of Devanur and Jane. Um, they have also, basically their competitive ratio there is implicit and relates to the solution of a differential equation. That's the closest to our design idea. And uh, there's a very nice set of papers that generalize the online LP work of, uh, of Sefi and others to convex covering and packing problems, and they still get uh, nice competitive ratios in terms of the largest problem data. And uh, a parameter that is very much like our alpha shows up in, in their bound as well. Uh, so it would be very interesting to explore these relations more. Um, also, another interesting relation is connection of competitive ratio to regret in this sense of you're looking at regret when you go to dual. And uh, that has been pointed out in several papers. Uh, in particular, there's uh, this paper of Devanur and Agarwal is actually quite nice. They, uh, the paper is about a different topic, and it looks at a stochastic online setting. So it's very different from ours. Um, but it points out that you can look at regret bounds for online learning as a black box and uh, on the dual, and then use them to uh, relate it to the competitive ratio. And so summary and uh, our papers on this, if you're interested. Okay, I'll, I'll end there. Thanks. So we, we have time for several questions. Yeah. If I want to impose integrality, is like a, there, there's some online primal dual algorithms which also do that. Please. Impose what? Integrality on the primal, let's say. Uh, is there, does this framework like? Can... Um, so I don't know too much about that. I didn't really look into the integral thing. But the sequential update algorithm, if, for example, those sets FTs were polytopes, because you are minimizing a linear function over a polytope, gets to a corner of the polytope. And if those corners are integer, for example, if that was simplex, then it automatically gives you an integer solution. And that's why people often like this kind of sequential thing versus the versus the continuous modifying uh, version, uh, because it automatically gives you something integer. But if you decide to use the continuous modifying one, then you have to round in the end. And like, for specific problems, there are some very nice results. But we didn't really work on that aspect. Thanks. So, sorry. Uh, so in the so you the model, model, you, know, you mentioned a couple of results at the end. Uh, does your analysis give any insights into the like, competitive ratios of the random order models? No. We haven't yet actually done that, so we don't know. The thing that was nice here is that diminishing return gives a very nice guarantee, and we, we have nice ways of imposing diminishing return. Uh, in the stochastic case, that's not really there, so it's a, it's a different. I mean, I guess it's not needed out there. Uh, out yes. here, somehow, to prove results, we need. The diminishing returns. So we seem to need the re diminishing returns. 
Uh, yeah, so actually, uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Whether a design approach can be helpful for the stochastic setting or not. Yeah. So you had this uh, greedy algorithm initially. Uh, in that, how sensitive would be the quality of the solutions to if the problem was degenerate? Um, and then what do you mean? What is degenerate? So if you had the primal problem, for instance, uh, it was like a degenerate. For example, the sequential one, or right in this case. So if uh, if there was region chassis, there would have to be like multiple solutions for the old time. Would that affect the quality of the solutions? Here, yeah. Uh, I think it's okay. I think if the arg max is a set, anything in the set is okay. <coughs> Overall, I mean, at this high level of generality, um, yeah, I mean, if you want to pick specific ifs and specific size and analyze them actually what's happening and what's the rate for that particular algorithm, then one has to make it more specific. I guess this is a bit high level to really delve into uh, what happens inside the algorithm. Like, if you're doing Frank Four, for example, you're doing this type of thing. But then, of course, the behavior of Frankfurt really depends on what set was there and what's the properties of those sets. And the performance is in terms of properties of the, the set. Thank you very much. Thank you.